2017 was the year Baltimore set its highest per capita homicide rate in history. Earlier this year, we sat down with famed author and journalist Antero Piatella, author of Not In My Neighborhood, to discuss how Baltimore's history continues to define a city that harbors great divides in wealth and opportunity, crime and poverty, often drawn along racial lines. We started off by discussing the removal of several Confederate statues in Baltimore after the deadly attacks by white supremacists in Charlottesville. Well, they are reminders of a period when Baltimore was one of the most segregated cities in the United States, uh, often more segregated than Richmond, for instance. Uh, supermarket, uh, uh, department stores were segregated here. Uh, as to the uh, racial climate here, as to the KKK, I came to the city in 1969. I remember going to cover KKK rallies in Patterson Park and in Riverside Park in Federal Hill. Um, I um, uh, know that the uh, peak of KKK activity in Baltimore was in the 1920s when the organization here was headed by the city's chief highway engineer and a dentist. And there was a Klan home on Madison Street uh, near, near Mount Royal Avenue. So, I mean, I mean there is lots of history. Uh, that history uh, is not understood. Uh, and those, those uh, statues, they were reminders of one version of the history. One of these statues, the Spirit of the Confederacy, which was built in 1903 on Mount Royal Avenue, that was an area that was at the heart of the fight over segregation, which led to the first law mandating segregation in the entire country. So I recently spoke to students at Renaissance Academy, located at 1301 McCullough Street, about how segregation continues to impact their lives today. Raise your hand if you know someone that has been badly hurt or killed in the last couple years because of violence in Baltimore. It's almost, almost everyone here. I mean, for people getting hurt in the streets, it makes parents more scared and prepared like for when that kid or anybody go out on the street to, to do anything because they don't know what is going to happen. They, gonna, they don't know if they kids is going to be able to make a home safe. Like, I kiss my mother and hug my mother every morning and tell her I love her because who's to say someone won't stop me in the middle of the street and just go ahead in my life today. Like, I, I really feel that I'm going to be killed walking down these streets. As you know, they got law and books with your, your agenda and everything. We're so here, we don't got none of that. And I, I was like, in a county school in seventh grade, I, lo I learned about, like, algebra. So when I came here, it was, they were still learning pre-algebra, and that's in ninth grade, and I was in middle school when I took algebra. So you just heard those students um, at Renaissance Academy. Three, three of their classmates have been killed in the last year and a half. Can you reflect on the voices of the young people today, growing up really in the shadow of, of the history of policies that were created more than 100 years ago? Well, I mean, it's kind of interesting that they are going to a school that 100 years ago was the Western High School for young women, white women. And when that area started the uh, uh, racial segregation push in Baltimore, when W. Ashby Hawkins bought 1834 McCullough Street, uh, that school then was moved. It was moved to Mondamin Mall to a building that is today's Frederick Douglass. And then when that area became black, then the school moved again to uh, uh, Falls Road and, uh, and uh, Cold Spring Lane. Uh, so, so, I mean, the school system reflects your, your racial conditions. And for these young people, clearly race is part of living in Baltimore. And, and in uh, Tanahesi, Coates' book, one of the most striking things for me was to understand that walking through neighborhoods from your school every day, it presented for these kids a challenge. You had to know 
where to go, with whom to go, in order to escape harm. And talk a little bit more about McCullough Street and that, and that specific area and how that became um, sort of the ground zero for the fight of segregation nationwide. Every neighborhood keeps changing. Uh, some neighborhoods change more than others, but every neighborhood through the years changes in terms of population, ethnicity, wealth, religion. And so what happened on McCullough Street leading to 1910 was that it was seen as a changing area that produced lots of white vacancies that nobody wanted to take. At the same time, blacks were prevented from re living there. And then comes W. Ashby Hawkins, one of the founders of NAACP. He buys a property at 1834, and suddenly blacks are coming in. And, and so uh, a uh, mini panic of sorts begins, and, and more and more whites start moving out. And then in response, the city passed a law which prevented um, African Americans from moving into a, a block that was majority white and vice versa. And this was replicated across the country. Yes. So at The Real News, and we'll talk more about that and the impact it has today. At The Real News, we cover national, international news, as well as events in Baltimore, and working on something new, going hyper-local, starting with the 14 District, which ranges from Johns Hopkins University to Lake Montebello, to diverse area that represents much of the city. Um, the affluence, the entrenched poverty, the working class spirit of the city, um, as you detail in Not In My Neighborhood, bigotry shaped Baltimore's in ways that are still felt and seen today. Um, and this is an excerpt of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Moving Image Archives, WJZ 13 collection about blockbusting, something which your book details in the Montebello area during the 19, late 1970. Here's that clip. This is a look at one Baltimore neighborhood, part of the Montebello section. It is no longer really a changing neighborhood, it is a changed neighborhood. But like so many other Baltimore communities, the change has not been natural. It has been forced, forced from white to black and gradual deterioration by the federal government, the city, and the state's long neglect of open housing. It has been forced by the neglect of the established financial institutions, which saw black people as poor risks. And ultimately, it has been forced by real estate speculators who saw a quick profit in the structure of human fear and ignorance. Well, I happened to be sitting on the steps with a friend of mine, and the man that had gotten the house from the woman next door, he came up and he said to me, uh, would you like to sell? And I said, no, I couldn't afford to sell because I can't afford to go anywhere else. And he said, uh, you won't sell? I said, no. He says, well, pardon me, Angie, these are not my words. He said, what are you going to do when these niggers move in here? And they get out on a porch in the summer and they drink beer. I said, hell, I'm going to join them. <laughs> <laughs> and I do, right? Yeah. You're darn right. Because we're very friendly. What happens to you uh, if you're late in your payments at all? Or, you know, if you, if you don't make your weekly payments right on time? Well, we get a court order. How, how, how long does that take to get a court order? If well, you're we late? have our payments are due on Saturday. If they're not there by Monday, then by Tuesday around 12 or 1, we get a court notice. A court, and then what do you have to do with that? Well, we usually always go in and pay them, but you have to pay two dollars for it, the court order. But every week, are you convinced that you really are buying your house? No, not really. You were told though that you were uh -huh. going to be buying your house. Yeah. How long do you think it'll be before you own the house? <laughs> well, they said I think it's a 15-year mortgage. Yeah. Apparently, but uh, like I said, I haven't seen anything to say that you know how, how much we you know paid into yeah. it. So reflect on that on that exchange there. Um, we, that was an investigation by WJZ into blockbusting, um, how it, it described how this neighborhood was changing. A few African Americans were moving in or, or getting close. And then um, these blockbusters would come and sort of, a, as we heard in the clip, um, extol the fears of black people moving into the neighborhood, which caused this flight of white people um, away from the neighborhood. And we heard two, two residents' perspectives about that. And this happened across the city. Um, give us your thoughts. 
What you saw was extraordinary. It, it is a unique piece of television reporting by Christopher Gall. He got sued for this report uh, by blockbusters. And the reason was that unlike any other reporter, he named names. And of course, we saw that he also interviewed people. So he, he put faces on a process that was very, very hectic in that area, the, the racial change process. And, and another reporter, the Evening Sun reporter, Tom Edsel, did something very interesting at the same time. He followed a neighborhood uh, overnight and came to the conclusion that every night uh, some of the busybodies in the neighborhood uh, gathered together to talk about race and how blacks were coming in and how, what fights they had. And when Tom Edsel then checked the hospitals and police reports, nothing reflected that there ever was any fights. It was just a psychosis that was being created. And so there are still streets today in Baltimore that separate separate affluent white neighborhoods from low-income African-American neighborhoods. There's one in particular that's important to me because I lived, I, I traveled through there every day for a year. It's on Green Mountain and 33rd Street. It, it separates Waverly and, um, and uh, another neighborhood that was created by the Roland Park Company, which was, which was an exclusively white neighborhood, the neighborhood of Guilford, which still exists today is predominantly white. Um, talk, you talk a little bit about the history of that area, um, because it's just, it's one of the, for me, and from what I've seen in this city, it represents, represents some of the greatest uh, contrasts you can see between wealth and poverty and opportunity um, in this, that, that exists in this city. Well, the history of that area is that it all was estate lands, big estates. Guilford, on the other side of Greenmount Avenue, belonged to A.S. Abel, the founder of the Baltimore Sun, other nearby big estates included Johns Hopkins's, Clifton, uh, uh, the Garretts, uh, uh, Montebello, 1,500 acres from, from that area all the way to Lauraville. So, so then comes a time when they are all split up for development. So Roland Park Company gets Guilford, which becomes arguably the most prestigious of uh, city neighborhoods. Uh, lots of mansions, uh, park-like atmosphere. Then there is Greenmount Avenue dividing line. On the other side is a neighborhood uh, kind of corridor, and, and uh, that was uh, occupied by uh, uh, whites uh, in older houses, poor whites. And then next to it, on the other side was original Northwood. So in fact, what you had were two neighborhoods, Guilford and original Northwood, that on the redlining maps in the 1930s were categorized as the best neighborhoods in Baltimore. And then there is this liver in the center. Mm. And so uh, before we got into Second World War, that sliver was earmarked for an ambitious uh, renewal project. And, and, and the, the uh, uh, focus was to encourage or compel the existing homeowners to uh, update their houses so that the topmost Roland Park properties, Guilford and original Northwood, would be secure so that there would be no, no inferior people living in the middle there. Mm. Well, nothing ever happened to that. And of course, now uh, that sliver is African-American uh, bordering um, Guilford, which is mostly white, and uh, original Northwood, which is also mostly white. And if you look at life, uh, if you look at indicators, in those areas, health indicators, lead poisoning, uh, incarceration rates, le even life expectancy. There are stark differences between those two, those two areas. Um, talk about what, what accounts for that. H how are these two areas treated differently by, 
by pe people with resources and by government officials? Well, I mean, in terms of lead paint, it is, it is really one of the most destructive things in the city of Baltimore today, in that almost all houses built before uh, a certain uh, cutoff period. 1970, I believe. 1970, yeah. have lead paint. And what makes this problem so uh, terribly difficult to uh, resolve is that some of the early remediation efforts have belatedly been determined to be lacking, meaning that if you have a lead paint tainted house, it is never, it seems, uh, certain that it, a remediation is going to protect you. And so it is, it is kind of interesting also that the lead paint problem uh, underscores another thing that is different in Baltimore from Washington, D.C., for instance. Mm -hmm. Number one, Washington, D.C. has no vacant houses. It has lots of lead painted houses. But lead paint contamination is no problem in Washington because there is market demand for real estate. In Baltimore, there is no market uh, demand for much of this tainted real estate. And, and so then it becomes a problem because if you can sue a landlord and get, uh, get re, uh, an, an, an award uh, for um, uh, somebody having been harmed by lead paint, then you are collecting money. So in, in, in fact, what we have in the city, in the past we used to have ambulance chasers. Today we have lawyers that specialize in lead paint cases, trying to find landlords with uh, wealth that can be, can be uh, collected if you win the case.